How's it going? I'm here to do another video, another Secrets of New York tour. Secrets of New York. It's kind of like a sequel, I guess, but uh, think of it more as like a Godfather 2, not as much of a, I don't know, Son of the Mask. <laughs> son of the Mask. I didn't say it. I didn't say it, Eric. I, I don't really going. No, no, I'll never, I'll never make fun of you again for recommending me the new Matrix movie. <laughs> I'll never live that down. Anyways, guys, today I'm going to cover some more secrets, uh, secrets in this city that you may not know. People who live here, people who have born here and raised here, people who are just visiting here. Things you may not know when you walk around, these stories behind these different things. It's going to be a good one. These are even more obscure than the first uh, episode, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're here at one of the big secrets in New York. I'm actually here in um, uh, New York Harbor down in, uh, outside of Battery Park. Uh, for the secret here, this is uh, the statue is hidden here in the harbor. It's this huge 150 foot copper statue that no one knows about. It's called the Statue of Liberty. Did you know about the Statue of Liberty, Eric? I saw it when we walked in. Yeah, isn't it crazy? You, never, you would never have known it's here if it wasn't for me. Uh, but no, I've covered that before. Uh, all, all joshing aside, look at us, we're just being so silly. Uh, you can check that out in my Statue of Liberty video. But uh, Eric, how you doing, man? Doing good. Yeah? What do you think we uh, we should uh, we should walk around here and get get some uh, get some of these little uh, lesser known secrets of New York out there? Secrets of New York. All right. Well, before we start, real quick, guys, check out the Patreon that helps fund these things. All that crud. That's a, that's a nice little business here. Also, too, like the video, give it a thumbs up. Come on, I'm out of here giving you some good stuff. Also, too, subscribe. That helps uh, all the analytics. Uh, you know, helps bump bump this up uh, ahead of all the uh, hot podcast takes on uh you know on you know foreign policy from people who barely graduated high school uh is that does that mean eric no accurate okay well anyways uh what do you think eric should we get this started yeah, let's go let's do it all right so we're here at our first stop i'm here in city hall park uh, next to what is known as the Liberty Pole. This is the secret here. Secrets secret of New York, huh? But this was put here in 1921 to commemorate the Liberty Poles that used to be located here. Now, before City Hall was here, this area was known as the Commons. And when this was a British colony, this is where the barracks of the British was located. Uh, now, in 1766, the, uh, uh, the colonists put up a Liberty Pole to kind of thank King George for repealing the Stamp Act of 1765. It was to thank him, but it was also kind of just like, a, yeah, that's right, baby, don't do it again. So the actual British soldiers who lived in this barracks, you know, these young kids, they'd be sitting in their room, you know, looking around, they'd see their Scarface poster or whatever, and then they'd look out the window and they'd see this Liberty Pole kind of like as a, you know, a middle finger, and they, they took insult to it. So they would tear it down, and it went back and forth throughout the late 1760s uh, until 1769 when the colonists had put up a new pole, and they also put up a broadside. Uh, now, a broadside is just kind of like a poster, but it, it was a big announcement to the, to the, to the colony. Uh, you know, it was kind of like, you know, posting on Twitter. You know, so back then, you know, your weirdo, you know, conspiracy theorist uncle probably would have been posting all of his theories about fluoride in the water on broadsides and not on his Twitter account. So they put up a broadside kind of telling the British like, you know, chill out. They had just passed the Townsend Acts of 1767. There was a lot of bad blood. Uh, so anyways, they posted that broadside. Then in 1770, after the British had already knocked down that pole again, the colonists were fuming. This is January 16th, 1770. A man named Isaac Sears, who was kind of a tough guy around town, he always got the colonists riled up to protest against the British. And another guy named Walter Quackenboss, the quack, the quackmeister, they were walking down the street and they saw these uh, British going up to put up their own broadside. Uh, and they're like, yo, man, screw these guys. So they get into this skirmish, and uh, so much so that uh, Isaac Sears throws a ram's horn at one of them. A ram's horn, that's what you do. When you walk around New York, make sure you always carry a ram's horn to keep yourself safe. So the big skirmish, you know, it ensues more troops, more, uh, more colonists, and it's known as the Battle of Golden Hill in January 1770. 
Interestingly enough, it preceded the Boston Massacre by over a month. So this was actually the first bloodshed. They say one colonist died, a bunch of people were injured, uh, the streets ran red with their blood. It, it was a big, big mess. But it preceded the Boston Massacre by over a month, and they say it's the first bloodshed of the American Revolution. But the Boston Massacre had better PR. Anyways, it's all kind of, you know, it's resolved, I guess, in a way. But uh, the bad blood continued, obviously, into the uh, actual War of Independence. Uh, now, in 1776, New York City was actually taken as the headquarters of the British for the entire duration of the Revolution, the entire duration of the War of Independence. Uh, it wasn't until 1783 that they were booted, uh, but it came this close. New York City became this close to becoming a British city. Huh? Isn't that crazy? You better believe that if it was a British city, there would not be as many foodies taking pictures of their brunch uh, wandering around the city. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had British food, but uh, not great. Uh, what do you think about that, Eric? I think British food is terrible. All right, take it easy. We got yeah, some. We got some British. Food. All right, relax. We don't want to. I don't want to get blogged about over here. I'm sure there's some British viewers here, but uh, yeah, it stinks. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, that all happened here in 1770. Uh, and like I said, it was the headquarters for the British until 1783. Uh, and yeah, the British had actually won the revolution. We'd all be here speaking English, <laughs> you know, God forbid. Uh, so, oh, and also too, this is all City Hall Park. It's located right here next to, uh, next to People with AIDS Plaza. Uh, that's actually what it's called, a little on the nose. Imagine it's right down the block from Dudes with HPV Square. So this goes to show you too that there have always been battles over the public monuments. The Liberty Poles getting torn down, getting put back up, torn down. Kind of reminds you of some of the stuff going on today, uh, you know? It's kind of interesting, but monuments play a very important role. And uh, they are a very important symbol. So, yeah, fights about them. Anyways, uh, what do you say we go to our next stop, Eric? There's a lot. We crammed a lot into that first one. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so we're now in Central Park. Um, actually, to talk about a very hidden secret. Uh, the Grid Plan of 1811, the Commissioner's Plan uh, by John Randall is one of the most important things that happened in New York, and there are very few traces of it left. But here in Central Park, near about, what, 65th Street, on top of a stone uh, is one of those remnants. This thing, this is one of the iron spikes that John Randall and his team used to delineate where intersections were going to be located on this grid. Now the grid mapped out New York, Manhattan, which you know was New York at the time, in 1811 from Houston Street all the way to 155th Street. Crazy. And he put markers at every one of those over 1,500 intersections. It's a big deal. Very few are left, but this is one of them. He used the uh, metal because it's in a stone. It had to be strong. This is before this was even Central Park. Part of this process was him just going around the island in what was then like mosquito infested, you know, wilderness. You know, his, his team was getting drunk all the time. No one wanted to do it. Very thankless job. But it's because of that that today Manhattan is populated the way it is. That grid plan is one of the beautiful accidents of New York that's allowed for this island to have all the skyscrapers building upwards and allowed it to be populated. In 1811, there wasn't much settlement uh, north of Lower Manhattan, north of City Hall. Uh, so it was kind of just planning for it all. And people were very angry because it cut properties in half. They, they were given money, obviously, but they weren't allowed to you know, realize the full potential of all their properties uh, because of this grid plan. You know, roads cut right through properties and that grid was very, very difficult to implement. And on that grid plan, there was no parks. There was barely any parks. In fact, Central Park was an afterthought. It had to be pushed for by people like William Cullen Bryant of Bryant Park, who I talked about in my Bryant Park video, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was pushed out later. But you have things like this that still stick around. And you know, people make little treks to this. All the urban planning nerds, like myself, you know, come to see this little tiny spike here in the stone of Central Park to be reminded of that history. Uh, you know, I would say that the grid plan is one of the most important things to happen in New York, but we're sitting on history here. Well, I'm not sitting on it, all right? I'm not sitting on the spike. All right, let's just make that clear. I'm just sitting next to it. Uh, it's pretty cool, right, Eric? It's cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. People, I always see people, they freak out when they, well, very few people, but they do freak out. Uh, so, kind of interesting, and you have a remnant of it here. Yeah, pretty cool. 
No, no, this is real, man. I ain't making this up. This is a real thing. They, they don't haven't put a plaque on it yet or anything, but uh, it wasn't like I was just like, oh crap, what am I gonna put in the video now? I can't think of anything. Well, that, let's just say that metal spike is uh, part of the grid plan, huh? That's not what I did. Close enough. Yeah, I could have done that if I was if I was dishonest, but I'm not. All right, well, I'm, my back's hurting. I'm too old to be sitting like this, so I gotta get to the next spot. So I'm out here next to St. Paul's Chapel. Uh, not much of a secret here on Broadway. It's actually the oldest church in New York. Uh, a continuously occupied church is actually where George Washington went to pray after he was inaugurated as president in New York City. Uh, but what's more of a secret is this obelisk here at the northeast corner of the uh, plot here. Uh, it belongs to a man named William J. McNevin. He died in 1841. So a little bit about him. He spent his life fighting for Irish independence. Uh, he was, you know, he got him, he was imprisoned. He went to France and tried to get uh, troops from Napoleon to fight the uh, British and get Irish independence. Then he came here in uh, New York City uh, eventually in 1805. He became a very prominent doctor, actually. Uh, was head of the uh, cholera board uh, of New York. That's quite a party starter, uh, you know, quite a, quite a little thing to drop at any uh, gathering. Uh, head of the cholera board. People are like, oh, nice to meet you. All right, great. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you know what cholera is. It's very unpleasant. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details because you're probably trying to eat something maybe while you watch this. And he died in 1841. This wasn't put here until 1865. 25 years later by some Johnny come lately. But what's more important is why they put it here. Now there was a group called the Fenian Brotherhood. The Fenian Brotherhood uh, was this group that pushed for Irish independence. Uh, and it was started in the mid 1800s. Uh, and one of the things they did was they laundered money to get buy guns, pretty much. And one of the ways they laundered money was buying things like this, uh, huge obelisks. I don't know if you know this, but obelisks were used in the 1800s to you know, mark points of, of energy and, and importance. Uh, men love their obelisks because they look like huge. So the Fenian Brotherhood uh, was actually a trying, at the time, to fund its raids into Canada. That's right, in the late 1860s, the Fenian Brotherhood tried a handful of unsuccessful raids into Canada with the intent of kidnapping Canada and then holding it for ransom from the British who would then give Irish independence in return for Canada. Not a very well thought out plan, I don't think. Hey, I got it guys. Let's kidnap Canada from the British. And someone's like, uh, but then what do we do? And he's like, we hold it for ransom and then get Irish independence? Jesus, do I have to think of everything? Well, it didn't quite work out that way. In fact, a lot of the uh, former Civil War veterans who took part in that uh, were eventually arrested because, go figure, it's actually a crime to launch a foreign war from American soil. But this little obelisk still continues here. Uh, was one of the ways that uh, they funneled money into these groups, uh, the, into this group, the Fenian Brotherhood. Uh, still there, William J. McNevin, right here in the northeast corner of St. Paul's Chapel. Kind of interesting, huh? We're here in uh, New York right now. It's almost uh, St. Patrick's Day, which is kind of interesting, huh? You ever been here for St. Patrick's Day, Eric? Uh, maybe not. Well, it's pretty crazy. Uh, I'd probably stay out of the streets if you can. Uh, you know, people like to drink the old booze, so... Uh, Back in Chicago, we dyed the river green. Yeah, they dye stuff here green. A lot of beer, a lot of green beer here. Well, uh, and dying, then green... Dying frat boys green. Yeah, dying frat, frat boys piss in the streets green, uh, pretty much, but uh, yeah. Looking Anyways, to it. yeah, it's going to be a good, we'll do a video for that. <laughs> we'll go out. Anyways, that's uh, William J. McNevin. It's kind of interesting. Obelisk, St. Paul's Chapel. Let's go to the next spot. All right, so we're here at our last stop. This is the Alexander Hamilton Customs House at the beginning of Broadway. It used to be very important. Customs was the main source of revenue for the federal government before the income tax. So it's a very beautiful Beaux Arts building. Uh, and part of Beaux Arts was a, uh, you know, sculpture. So here you have the Daniel Chester French sculptures. He was the guy who did the Lincoln Memorial. We've covered that in past videos. Check out the Financial District video. <laughs> okay, but. Uh, up at the top, you have these uh, 12 statues made of Tennessee marble, each representing a different seafaring nation uh, around that time, throughout history. Uh, very important ones, ones that have played big roles. Uh, you have Greece, you have Rome, you have uh, Holland, uh, Peter Stuyvesant, you have uh, Genoa in Italy, you have uh, uh, good old Columbus up there. But you also notice one that's kind of out of place. It's Belgium. 
Belgium's got like 40 miles of coastline. Not a very important uh, seafaring nation, uh, you know. I guess it's not a, it's not a, they're not statues representing countries that are famous for waffles or fries or uh, pissing little boys. Uh, yeah, I know that's weird. Uh, you're probably wondering, what the hell was that, Tom? It's kind of weird. Uh, you know, you're making me nervous here. Their whole, like, actual, one of their national symbols is a little, little boy pissing. It's like a little statue. Uh, it's called mannequin piss. Uh, it's a statue that survived a lot of stuff. I guess that's for another video, but uh, kind of funny trivia. Anyways, it's up there for a reason. Now, what happened was, during World War I, in 1918, with all the anti-German uh, sentiment, the Treasury Secretary, William McAdoo, wanted that to be, uh, you know, get, get rid of the, the Germans up there because that used to be Germany, because Germany is a famous seafaring nation. So they approached the sculptor. His name was Albert Jaegers. He was a German-American who's like, yeah, I'm not going to change it. I don't want to change it. Uh, so they were like, oh crap, so they had to find a way to change it. So they did as minimal amount of work as they could to change it, which included writing Belgium really big on the shield. That's it. They just wrote Belgium. Yeah, a lot of work they did, but they also took off a couple of insignia. They took off uh, the word Kyle, and we're talking about Kyle like K-I-E-L, like the city in Germany. Uh, not Kyle like the guy who's always hanging out at the frat house, willing to play beer pong. Uh, you guys party? You know Kyle? You know Kyle? He's sick, bro. Not that, Kyle. Uh, so, yeah, not that. And also, too, they took the, the like the different insignia off the actual statue. They had a, a German eagle that they took off. But yeah, kind of cool. Uh, so it's now Belgium. Uh, you know, they could have done any country, but uh, you know, they chose Belgium. They could have done Nicaragua. Wait, wait, come on. What about a little Nicaragua? There's more coastline. Uh, but yeah, kind of interesting. Covered that in my financial district video, I think. Uh, did I already mention that, Eric? Uh, I think I did. Maybe. Uh, what do you think? That's a kind of a cool trivia, huh? Yeah. So they just. Into that? Yeah, they just they just chiseled Belgium sure, into the shield. That in a bit. Yeah, it's kind of phoned in. Uh, you know, what can you do? I guess uh, save some money. Uh, what do you think of mannequin piss? I will Wikipedia that later. <laughs> no comment, huh? No comment. Yeah, all right, that's fair. You don't want to you want to incriminate yourself. All right, well uh, that's pretty much it for the last uh, spot. I guess we uh, keep on moving. End this thing, huh? All right, let's do it. All right, guys, here we are, back to where we started. Uh, no, I didn't just shoot the intro and outro at the same time. <laughs> I actually walked around and came and ended here. Uh, but we covered a lot, guys. We covered a lot today. Taught you guys a little bit about the American Revolution. Taught you guys a little bit about the Irish in the city. And taught you guys about some of the anti-German sentiment that came about and how it manifested itself in the buildings here. Uh, we covered a lot. Eric, what did you think? Did you learn a lot? Are you lying because uh, we actually haven't covered it and uh, we're shooting this at the beginning of the day? Too much behind the curtain. Sorry, um, I shouldn't have done that. Well, anyways, uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we go ahead and, uh, you know, well, first of all, guys, go ahead and look, take a look at the Patreon. That's a big help, man. Funds these things, you know, all that crud. Also, too, subscribe, big, uh, big help. You know, gets this thing to grow, get, uh, you know, get past all those other YouTube videos we're competing with, like the, uh, you know, reaction videos to other people's TikTok videos of Instagram reels, of YouTube shorts, of whatever, you know, and also to like it, give it a little thumbs up. But uh, other than that, I think we're pretty much done, man. What do you think, Eric? Should we just, uh, you know, go, it's a nice day today. We can go down to the, uh, you know, pier, have a churro. I'd say an ice cream, but uh, we don't want to tempt the weather. Yeah, I think you're right, actually. Um, all right, well, uh, let's go have a, an ice cream and a churro, and uh, out of a churro straw. All right, well, anyways, I'll leave you guys with this last secret of New York, the Statue of Liberty. See y'all later. Sick. <laughs>